You are Locked On Auburn, your daily podcast on the Auburn Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on into Locked On Auburn, your daily Auburn Tigers podcast. I'm your host, Zach Blackerby. And joining me as he does every Monday for a little money Monday action, Lindsey Crosby, the Auburn banker himself, the massive Braves fan himself. Congratulations. We're going to the World Series, baby. You'll love to see it. It's there. First, time, first time in my adult life. So I'm very happy about it. Unreal. Very happy for you. Very happy for you and all the Braves fan listening. A lot of Auburn fans are Braves fans, so uh, should be a good one. And also, we're back to game week. Uh, the whole bye week stuff. It's fun to be able to sit down and like watch college football and not have to like worry about anything but it's very boring and i get jealous of all the other teams that are playing so i'm glad we're back in a game week obviously against Ole miss a very big one we got to watch Ole miss take on lsu and that was kind of a game where a lot of people had circled Lindsay as far mm-hmm. as okay can Ole miss look vulnerable you know the, can lsu pull off some kind of miracle for the second week in a row they really embarrass florida could they possibly embarrass Ole miss and i'm seeing a lot of people say that Ole Miss did not look very good against LSU, and I don't know what they were watching. Watching that game, I'm like, crap, Ole Miss is better than I thought they were. That's what I took away from it. Yeah, uh, that game was 31-7 to entering garbage time. I mean, they Ole Miss played well. Ole Miss wasn't great on third down, 5-13, of 13, uh, converted every fourth down opportunity that they had. I think one of them was, uh, what, that fourth and 12 that went for a touchdown? I mean... Matt Corral looked, I don't think he's 100%, but he's close enough where it doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, that, that defense is better than I thought it was. Old Miss is a legitimate contender to win the West. Um, but thankfully, so are we. So is Alabama. That's right. That's right. And so, yeah, you mentioned fourth down. And I think that's going to be a huge thing for the Tigers on Saturday when they take on Old Miss. at Jordan Hare Stadium, which I think will be a huge advantage, the fact that it's at home. But you got to beat Ole Miss on fourth down. That's what Alabama did. They forced um, that they forced early turnover on downs, and then Alabama just forced Ole Miss to be in this big hole early. But Lane Kiffin has been aggressive early, and they've gone for it on fourth down a lot. They've gone for it on fourth down thirty times this season. They've converted on twenty three of those uh, thirty. So that's over seventy six percent conversion rate on fourth down. They've held their opponents to nine of nineteen. So that's under fifty percent. Obviously, that to me is the big thing is when fourth down, can you make Matt Corral uncomfortable and can the offense uh, get a running game going? Those are my three questions going into Saturday's game against Ole Miss. Yeah. To me, the biggest thing is going to be what does Auburn do to contain Matt Corral? You're not going to stop this Ole Miss offense. It's just just not going to happen, but can you slow him down enough to give our offense a chance to keep up? And The problem is he's shown that he can win by throwing the ball. He's shown that he can win by running the ball. And so you have to figure, you have to decide how is he going to beat you? You know, which one do you think he's better at? Shut that one down and then try to limit him on the other side. And I think a big part of what we choose to do there is going to be dependent on do we have Owen Papo back on the field on Saturday? It seems like we will. It seems like Owen Papo will be back, but I've also thought that every week for the last <laughs> few weeks. So um, we'll see there. But yeah, you're right. As far as Matt Corral being dangerous on the ground and through the air, I haven't seen a team, and if it's happened, I, I believe you. I just haven't seen it yet. But a team really hasn't like put a dude like Owen on the field on third down where it's like, okay, you know, get people that come in the middle of the field, but your job is to to tackle Matt Corral if he's trying to run the ball. We haven't really seen any kind of QB spy action. And once again, uh, I haven't seen it. And I've watched a good bit of Ole Miss this year, and maybe people will do it on, you know, certain plays. But on third and 12, like Tennessee was like this. We joked about this last week uh, after they beat Tennessee, where it's like, okay, it's third and 12. Matt Corral is going to get a 14-yard run. Mm-hmm. And it's like we all saw it coming except for the Tennessee defense. And it's like, can can Auburn stop that? And I think they have the dudes to stop it. But I almost think Matt Corral's more dangerous as a runner than he is a thrower. And I know that's blasphemous to say because he's got a really good arm, but he's really, really athletic and he has really, really good feet. Yeah, and and I think his arm is fine, 
but I think a lot of his success through the air has been Lane Kiffin scheming guys open. And when you watch Ole Miss play, one of the things you see, especially on the explosive plays, is you see Ole Miss doing something that just gets a guy to break free. And so Auburn's defense is going to have to be disciplined, uh, going to have to keep Matt Corral in the pocket, make you know not give him the opportunity to just scramble and run like Tennessee. It was the weirdest thing. It's third down and 12, and we're like, okay, Tennessee's manning up. Everybody's turning their back to the quarterback and running down the field. Like, what are you doing? He's yep. just going to get out of the pocket and run. And I think Auburn has the guys, has the dudes to contain him. The question is, can we schematically not have those coverage busts that let those receivers break open, break free uh, to get those conversions? And I don't and know. I think, I think the bye week's a big deal. And a lot of people are kind of saying Auburn has a loss you know, uh, after a bye week in like a decade, which is factual. That is true. That's correct. That's exciting. But does that matter? Because of the majority of that decade wasn't anybody that's currently here now because it was all Gus Malzahn and his staff. And so I don't know if that matters. Um, I haven't seen Brian Harsin's numbers after a bye week. That would be something interesting to look at throughout the week there. But this is going to be a tough game. The fact that it's at home, I like that more than the bye week aspect of it. But I guess mm-hmm. the biggest part you could pull, the biggest advantage you could pull from the bye week is just the defensive backs getting more reps and more time kind of prepping for this lethal offense. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what is, what does Derek Mason do with this extra week as far as preparation goes? And maybe they do some more creative stuff on the back end and maybe they have more time kind of working that out and kind of understanding where everyone is supposed to be. That to me is the biggest takeaway and they're going to need it because They just make you cover everything Ole Miss does. I mean, just watching the LSU game on Saturday. They've got RPOs where it's like if a linebacker moves even an inch, like Matt Corral's got the cannon to like squeeze it into a a window to to get it behind the linebacker. And then boom, it's a 15-yard play on second and eight. It's like they they do not not, not make you – I mean, they keep you honest is what I'm trying to say. And so – I just I don't know how much of that you can fix in just um, in just one week. Yeah, it's you're you're defending all fifty three yards of grass, sideline to sideline, and they have the guys that they can they can get guys outside around you. They can get guys downfield. They can find the gaps. They're going to scheme receivers open. They're going to put your linebackers in impossible decisions. Okay, like you said, RPO. But the RPO has an option attached to it for the run. So you can't even just make the choice. You have to be disciplined and know, okay, I specifically have to do this and this to stop this basic play. So you're going to see a lot of – the issue you're going to have is you're going to see a lot of reacting from Auburn. You have to see what's going to happen in front of you and then react to it. And Ole Miss has the athletes to make you pay when they get that extra step, that extra advantage – of knowing what they're going to do. So, like I said, we're not going to stop Ole Miss on offense. We just have to contain them enough where the offense can keep up. Right. My dogs just went crazy. Apologize for anybody that heard that. It was it was wild. We have a visitor in our home. It's just... Pol- Polo is very fired up about this matchup as well. Uh, Polo's pumped. Polo's a big Auburn guy. I absolutely love that about him. Hey, today's show brought to you by our friends at Prize Picks. Lindsay, Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. So we're recording this Sunday morning. And it, it's essentially just a million different props that you can pick from um, day of. And so I picked, you know, I love quarterbacks, but you can do with, with running backs, receivers. I, I assume you can do defenders, but I, I haven't looked. But I've got a, a parlay of they make you pick two. They make you pick two. And then obviously the more you pick, the more you can win. But uh, I went with Matt Ryan with the over for 278 and a half passing yards and Zach Wilson with the jets for under 228 and a half passing yards. So I put those together. I put some money down and um, yeah, we'll see, but it, it's really fun. I think prize picks is, is um, they give you so many more options for daily fantasy than you typically see, especially with all these props. And uh, yeah, you need to check it out So go to prizepicks.com. I've done it. Uh, it's very, very fun. And when you uh, make your deposit, Use promo code locked on. It's it's even more fun when you're betting with other people's money. So they'll make a deposit match for up to a hundred dollars. Don't hesitate. Check out prizepicks.com today and use promo code locked on or go to your app store and download the app today. Prize picks is daily fantasy made easy. All right, Lindsay. A lot of people, um, 
a lot of people were fired up about that Alabama Tennessee matchup that happened Saturday night. Cause for a, for about a half, it was like, can Tennessee do this? It looked like they had a legitimate shot at beating Alabama. And then it, when it broke, it broke. It's like the Braves game started. Everybody flipped over to watch the first few innings of the Braves game. And then they went back <laughs> during a commercial break. And it's like, oh, it was like 34 to like 24. And then they turned it back. It was like 52 to something. It's like, goodness gracious. It all happened so fast. Yeah, Bama dropped 28 in the fourth quarter. And I keep wondering about like, so I have no idea what's going to happen in the Iron Bowl. And usually you have an idea that Auburn's going to be the underdog. Auburn's going to have to, you know, going to have to struggle to keep up, hope on some Jordan hair magic. I honestly don't know what's going to happen this year. This watching this Alabama team, it feels like they're getting by on talent. Like they just, they have the guys, they know they have the guys, and they throw the guys out there and wait for the talent to win them the game. And so because of that, when you have a good game plan and you execute it almost perfectly, like with Texas A&M, you can beat them. Uh, But at the same time, I don't think we should talk about this is not a good Alabama team. I mean, they're still second in points four scored in all of like 130 Division I teams. They're second in points per game. Uh, Points against, they're like 35th, 34th in points per game against Mm -hmm. so this is still a really talented team both on offense and on defense uh Bryce Young everybody talks about Bryce Young isn't really good Bryce Young's a 70 percent passer Bryce Young averages nine yards an attempt and and that is not counting that's not counting um drops and throwaways yeah that's not yeah that's not adjusted completion percentage that is yeah yeah, that is that is 70 percent completion nine yards every time he throws the ball whether it's caught or not Uh, The adjusted yards per, you know, the adjusted yards per attempt is like 10.6 from what I was looking at this morning. So first down every time he throws the ball. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. They average a first down down when he throws it. So this is a good team. I don't care what everybody says. I don't care what people think. Alabama is still a juggernaut. And so are, is that game winnable? Yes, that game is winnable, but Auburn has to have a really great game plan offense and defense and special teams and they've got to execute you can't have a repeat of that georgia game where you have the drops and you have the you know the missed completions and the the simple mix-ups you can't have a re- repeat of penn state where you forget to cover tight ends down the field right um so are they vulnerable Boy, we need to talk a about this in a second by the way holy yeah. cow that was a disaster gosh uh so is bama vulnerable yes but you've got to be perfect to pull it off Yeah, and to me, and this is just semantics at this point, but like, I don't think that makes them a vulnerable team. Like, if you have to play perfect against them, it's always been that way. I just don't think they're as good as they have been in the last two or three years. Yeah. Um, Because I I think Tua, by the time he, like, finally won the job, and, and then Mac Jones, by the time he got the job, they were just farther along in their development than, uh, than Bryce Young is. And I think Bryce Young next year is going to probably be the best player in college football. Uh, that's mm-hmm. just that's just my guess. But they're just not quite there yet, but they're still significantly better than everyone else that they're playing, especially from a talent standpoint. So like, I, I just watch Alabama and I'm like, they don't really seem vulnerable to me. It's just, they're not the best that they've ever been, but that's okay. I mean, that's that's, that's a normal thing. And so, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. They seem young. They seem a little inexperienced. But by the time the Iron Bowl happens, like I don't think that's going to be an issue for them just because it's like, okay, a season is behind you now. It's the last game of the year. Um, but I, I still think, yes, Auburn has a chance in it. It's at home. Weird things happen in the Iron Bowl at home. So we'll see. We'll see what's going on. But still, like the, the pass rush is not going to like magically get better. Because Alabama is "quote unquote" vulnerable, their offensive line is way better in the trenches than than Auburn is right now, and things can happen. But Bryce Young's still going to have forever to pass, especially mm-hmm. if we're not blitzing yet. You know what I mean? Like yeah, that's, when, that's just something that's not going to change. Yeah, they've got. When I say they're vulnerable, I mean you actually can look at that matchup and say, okay, there's a possibility where we win. If you look at Alabama two years ago or even Alabama last year. You look at that on paper, you're like, yeah, there's probably not a scenario where we win this game. Uh, now, I say that, and we we have won some recently, but um, 
there but is a path to victory. Craziest, that was the craziest Iron Bowl, in my opinion, ever. Like yeah. that, it was high school like, shenanigans. It was crazy. The two pick sixes, and then you know, just, just like guys like Sal Canella making just ridiculous catches. Like Bo Nix was not good in that game, but somehow, you know, somehow Auburn won it. So you're going to need something like that just because of the talent. The talent gap is just so large. It's so drastic. But you know, Harson's been prepping for that all year. And I think I think there's a chance this team could smell blood, especially if they win uh, against Ole Miss and AM and you know they take care of business up to that point because momentum's a real thing and belief mm-hmm. is a real thing. And uh, yeah, they can get it done. They can get it done. But you're, I think you're done hearing us say that Bama's vulnerable on this podcast. I, I don't think that that's a thing. Are they beatable? Absolutely. Are they vulnerable? No, I, I, I don't think they are. Let's talk about Penn State just for a second. Penn State lost to a very bad Illinois team. In a historic nine overtimes, crazy game, absolutely ridiculous. And I had forgotten about the rule change that after two overtimes, they like just trade PATs. I just forgot about that. Yeah, me too. Um, but man, was that a bad idea? That didn't work. So um, I'm not this kind of person that's like, oh my gosh, a tie in the NFL is like the worst thing in the world. I'm not that. Like, I'm like, okay. Like, w- watching Saturday, neither team deserved to win that game. I, I just that they both should have tied or lost. I don't care, but like it was an absolute joke. And uh, I think it hurt Auburn. I think it hurt Auburn's resume because we've been saying like, okay, Auburn's got two losses and they've got a chance to have only two or three losses at the end of the season. If things go right, I think that's, you know, best case scenario that we've been talking here. And one's going to be against Georgia who will be number one. And then Penn State had a chance to finish like top six. If they kind of took care of their own business and that didn't happen. And so like, I think Auburn's resume took a major hit as losing a quality loss on Saturday. And look, a lot of people are saying like, well, Zach, their quarterback was hurt. I'm like, sure, that's fine. But the committee doesn't care. The committee's not going to look at it that closely and be like, oh, Auburn lost to Penn State and Penn State's good, but Penn State lost to a team when their quarterback was bad. They're they're not going to go that deep into it. So I, I think Auburn's resume took a pretty big hit as far as like, Auburn trying to finish as a top 15 team when it's all said and done. I, I think that road got a little tougher. Yeah. Auburn's only path to a, a New Year's Six Bowl, you know, is probably going to be you can't lose more than one more game in the West. I mean, you, you your, your three big challenging matchups now are Ole Miss, AM, and Bama. And if you want a top 15 finish, if you want a New Year's Six Bowl, you have to win two of those three. I mean, that's that's the only thing. You can't count on the resume anymore. And I just want to point out, nine overtimes, 38 points. Really? Like... Unreal. Like, I saw somebody, I think it was in our Discord, because I was I was not watching that game, and I kind of regret it now, but... No, said, no, no, you came out on top on that deal. Yeah, yeah. Said, said hey, you know, Penn State lost to Illinois 20 to 18 and nine overtimes, and I thought they were joking because it's nine overtimes and there's 38 total points. Yeah. Wake Forest, our Wake Forest team, greatest quarterback in Wake Forest history. Uh, my grandfather, Carol Blackerby, shout out. There you, there you go. Wake Forest and Army scored together 126 points in regulation, and Penn State and I Illinois scored game, by the way. Yeah, I had the under. I was like, yeah, Army's going to hold the ball forever, and they did. They had the ball for like 44 minutes of possession. Wake Forest just threw up 70 in 16 minutes of game time. It's fine. Yeah. Um, Kind of, kind of regretting taking the under on that one, but the over under could have been a hundred, and you could have still taken the under and lost. How crazy is that? That's that's nuts. But like thirty eight points and nine, not come on, like Penn State, you're killing me here. Yeah. Um. So, you know, it's yeah, Auburn. If if we're looking the impact on Auburn, the impact on Auburn is now you have to win two of those last three to get a top fifteen finish in a uh, New Year's Six Bowl. But and, also, like that didn't change, right? That's always been the case. So, yeah. Well, does the conversation even matter? Or do you think it did change? As many top ten, top fifteen teams losing as we've seen in the last couple of weeks, I think the door was open there for you losing two of those three games and still having a good finish by virtue of the fact that everybody's lost a couple games. So yeah. you had that window before the pins because. Uh, because you could say, okay, yeah, Penn State, Georgia, top 10 teams, and then assuming it was Alabama and Ole Miss that beat you, you know, Alabama's going to be top 10. Ole Miss is going to be, you know, max or worst, 15th or 20th. 
And so it's, yeah, we have four losses all to, you know, top 15 teams. You had a window, and now with Penn State losing for the second time, being five and two, now you got to win two of the three if you want a top 50. It's, isn't it weird that we're talking about, you know, being ranked and like trying to get a top 15 finish when there were people predicting us to go five and seven this season? Isn't yeah. that wild? Yeah, and that could still happen. I just really don't think it's going to. I really like, don't just, think it's going to. Credit but, to Brian Harson for getting this team better every week. No, you're right. You're right. And I can't wait to see what the bye week does. I just talking with Chandler Wooten last week on the show. Like, it seems like it's different. It seems like the bye week and the preparation and all that's different, which is exciting. Um, but, you know, one last thing on the Penn State thing, and we'll move on. But the way, like, the way we do rankings in college football is a lot of the times you just kind of look at the record and then who they played. But now the question is like, how much does Auburn have to do to consistently be ranked ahead of Penn State? Because Penn State has as many losses as Auburn does, but Penn State beat Auburn, obviously. And that's kind of the way that they do a lot of that stuff. So can can we be moved? And we're, we're recording this before the AP and the coaches poll come out. But it's like, can we move ahead of them over the course of the season consistently? Um, and I don't know. I don't know if they'll do that. I mean, the Illinois loss is bad. The Illinois yeah, loss is yeah. really, really. I mean, going into the weekend, they only had one win. They were like one and five. I think they're two and five now. And so they're three and five now. Three and five now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So like total disaster. Total disaster of a team. So we'll see. We'll see how much that hurts them. But um, you know what would make all? You know what makes pain go away? Built bars. The best tasting protein bar ever. They came out with a new one. It was like blueberry muffin. You and I tried it. A little different. A little different. I like the peanut buttery flavors. Unusual, a little bit but good. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you could eat it because it was uh, it was gluten free, which is great because they they have different types of bars. They have bars for everyone. Lindsey Crosby. No matter what your diet is or what your uh, restrictions are, uh, Built Bar has something for you. It's all very high in protein, very low in calories, very low in carbs, very low in sugar, all that good stuff. Um, head over to built.com. Use promo code locked 15 L O C K E D one five to get 15% off your order. Use promo code locked 15 for 15% off at built.com. All right. Anything else football related before we move to baseball stuff that happened this weekend? I don't have much. I'm excited. We have a game again this week. Um, I for feel sure. like if of any week to not play the week where there was not really any good games, um, that was a bad call for a bye week there. Um, but if you are the kind of person who just takes a, a Saturday away from football for your family during the football season, you worked out okay on that one. Sure. So Auburn baseball, they had a an exhibition game against the Clemson Tigers at um at Plainsman Park. I wanted to go, had family in town, and so we we, we had to you know got to hang out with them. But I wanted to go. You did go, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What uh what all did you see? So. Auburn won 11-7 in, in 12 innings, and I've been able to go to a few of the open practices, some of the scrimmages, and then now this game, and you know, kind of had a chance to talk to some folks in the program, take some tours and things like that. I feel there's there's reasons to be really excited, and there's a, and there's a reason or two that I'm a little, not concerned, but a little curious how it's going to turn out. Offensively, I think this is a great team. Um, okay. Well, I've seen them, I mean, timely hitting, situational hitting. I mean, I've seen them executing bunts, sack flies to get runners over, hitting and, you know, in, in pitchers counts, doing all of the things, like all of the, the, the hard things that you have to do to win a baseball game. We've seen them do that. Um, I got a behind the scenes tour with the analytics folks and I can't go into full detail, but there's some cool new technology Auburn has in the batting cages that I think are partially responsible for this, that, um, that are really like a, a teaching tool and a training tool for the hitters that are helping develop this great offense that we have. I think we're going to see this offense be really good this upcoming season. Well, they and have the technology where they've like put the information in and the machine can like mimic a specific pitcher that they're going up against. Right. Is that what yeah. you're talking about? Yes. They can use the track man data and they can replicate the entire pitching repertoire of any NCAA pitcher that they have trackman data for, which is all the major programs. That's so, like, if 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 you know you have to take on Vanderbilt's ace on Friday, you can be in the cage on Thursday and you can see his slider, you can see his change, his fastball, and then they can set the sequencing. Mm -hmm. So they can go like, okay, we know he likes to throw this pitch on two two, and the batters can, in essence, can have live at bats against that pitcher. That's uh, so cool. That really is cool. So neat. 
really cool technology. Not everybody has it yet. Auburn's got that. Um, and you can tell they've been using it and it's been working. Uh, Clemson's pitcher, Clemson's starting pitcher, was th- this dude shoves, was throwing gas, a lot of movement on his pitches, and they were hitting him just like anybody else. Um, defensively, also feel really good. They have a lot of, of talented def- defensive guys to the point where they're having to find ways to get guys on the field because they've got so many great options. The pitching staff, I'm not 100% sure exactly how that's going to shake out. I kind of think I know who's going to be our starting rotation. You know, Carson Skipper, Gonzalez is going to be in there. But we don't have anybody that has the overpowering power. You don't, you know, we don't have anybody who's up there in the high 90s, you know, who's who's a fireball threat. But a lot of these pitchers have what I'm calling deception. So a lot of their pitches look the same when they come out of the hand and then halfway to the plate, all of a sudden they start breaking different directions. So it's not as easy to pick up on what they're doing. The stuff itself isn't overpowering, but the way that they're delivering it, they're getting the most out of the talent that they have. Not sure how that's going to work when you have time, when you see them twice in a series or over the course of the season, how well that's going to play all season once there's some tape on them. But I feel good about the base that they're starting off with as far as pitching. And just for me, I'm going to be watching uh, one who gets the closing gig because Saturday wasn't a true thing. They played 12 innings. It was all a tradition. And then who's that Sunday starter going to be? I'm pretty confident we're going to see Skipper and Gonzalez some form of one and two, probably Skipper first, Gonzalez second. Uh, Who's going to be that Sunday starter? And then how's that how's that middle relief um, setup man rotation kind of going to break out in the bullpen? But offensively, defensively, love this Auburn de- this Auburn baseball team. So w- were there any transfers that stood out to you so far, whether you, what, what you've seen in practice or what you saw over the weekend? Sonny Dechara uh, came out of Samford, senior. He's playing first base. This guy can hit. He's okay. got a lot of power. Um, and he has power that projects to, I mean, MLB level power. A um, lot of situational hitting. You can see him. You know, he comes up, there's a guy on base. He's not only hitting, you know, he's 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 trying to put it over the fence like a lot of them do, but he's making sure he can change the approach when he gets two strikes. He's going in there. He's able to to get that ball in play in a position where we can at least advance a runner, if not get a run in. So really impressed with him offensively, just kind of what he's done. Um Integrated into the team, playing first base. I saw this man get a triple. 267 pounds. I saw this man make it to third base. He's not the fastest in the world, but he's got hustle. Sure. I'll tell you what. So, love to see that. He's been one of the stars. And then not a transfer, but um, Brody Moore uh, right now was playing shortstop on Saturday. Yeah. Um, him and Garrett Farquhar seem like they're kind of battling for that shortstop job. But both of them just really stepping up, not only offensively, but defensively as well. Great defense. Timely hitting. And then Ryan Dial at catcher. I really think Ryan's going to be one of the the more important players this season. We've got plenty of uh, catchers, plenty of guys that can um they can lead a pitching staff, but this guy's got the combination offensively, defensively, and game calling. Really excited about him. Cool, absolutely, man. Yeah. So we picked up a lot of new listeners over the course of football season. We're still going to be daily uh, Auburn football as things happen, but as we get closer to basketball. We're going to have weekly visits from folks tied to the Auburn basketball programs. That Jasser is one of them working on another. Um, so we'll have that. And then we will have multiple people on for uh, throughout baseball season as well. So we're your one-stop shop for the, the big three uh, sports and um, for, for Auburn athletics. So just uh, kind of wanted to, I've, I've got a few questions asking you, are you going to talk basketball? And so absolutely. And we'll talk baseball as well as Lindsay's our kind of resident Auburn baseball expert there as well. Lindsay, where can people find you and hear you, my friend? I am at Auburn Banker on the socials and in our Discord, and you can check me out 7 to 9, Monday through Friday, on News Talk WANI. Absolutely. That's Lindsey Crosby, the Auburn Banker himself, on this Money Monday. Follow me on Twitter at C Blackerby, the show on Twitter at Locked on Auburn, and on Instagram at Auburn Podcast. And if you're watching on YouTube, please click that subscribe button. It helps a ton. And leave us a review on iTunes. If you're listening on iTunes, five stars. It goes a long way. It helps us move up in those search rankings. We would appreciate it a ton. We'll be back tomorrow with a Charlie Tuesday right here on Locked on Auburn.